Somebody needs to know it, needs to hear it, needs to believe it. And he's working. That he's really working. He's not sleeping on the job. He's not forgotten. He's working. He's not forgotten you. He's working. Behind the scenes, he's putting it all together. All the pieces of the puzzle, all the characters who need to show up, everything that needs to be arranged at its proper time will be there. He's working on you. He's working on you even now. He's working. Be encouraged that he's working. Let's go before the Lord in prayer now. Father, we thank you, Lord God. Because, God, your word says that he who guards us never sleeps. You're not just sitting back and folding your hands and watching. And You're not surprised, God, by what comes about. God, you've orchestrated every step. God, you've meticulously designed, Lord God, every single process, God. Every second, every minute, every hour of our lives, Lord God, you know it. You know the hairs on our head. You've numbered them, God. You've counted all the stars and you know them all by name, God. You know every grain of sand on the seashore, Lord. So, Father, we thank you, God, that we don't have to worry. That we don't have to stress, God. Even this season, God, I thank you, Father, that you're bringing everything together that needs to come together, God. God, that we're not scrambling, we're not running, we're not doing what the world does, but God, we're in the flow. We're resting. We're at, we're at peace, God. I thank you for your supernatural peace in this place, Lord. For your peace, God. For the uneasy heart, for the restless soul, Lord, even now. The Lord says he's lifting anxieties. Cast your cares on me, says the Lord. He says, I'm lifting your anxieties, your burdens. I'm taking the stress. Father, we thank you. We thank you, God, that it all belongs to you. Let us not take on what we can't take on ourselves. We thank you, Lord. We all pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Wow. Yeah, he's working. He's working. Yeah. You know, Alan said something so profound Friday night. Yeah, he said, when we sing that song, Waymaker, you know, we are, we are not singing to remind God of who he is. We are singing because we are reminding ourselves of who God is. And I was like, wow, man, that was, that was heavy, Alan. Every now and then, you got some deep stuff, man. Every now and then, you know, we have, we have some silly conversations, me and Alan, and, you know, every now and then, he drops a bomb on me. I'm like, whoa, I got to chew on that. That's good stuff. And that was heavy, you know, that we need to remember who God is because from time to time, we forget and we think that God is, is off somewhere but he's never off. He's never missing a beat. He knows exactly what we need when we need it. So today my message is called Time and Space. Time and Space. How many of you know time is valuable? Time is valuable. And the older you get, the more you value time. Amen? You know, I, I get upset with people younger than me. I get upset with people even who are older than me who don't appreciate the value of time. Because it's so precious. You know, you spend time and you don't get it back. It's a rare commodity. Once you've, you've spent it, it's gone. You can't earn more time. It's so precious. And, you know, uh, for many of you know, I teach fifth grade in addition to pastoring. And so with my students, I'm a, I'm a little harsh at times because I'm like, you just don't get it. You don't get it. Your future is at stake. It's your time. You know, parents, you know, you guys know as you're raising preteens and teens, you know, my daughter's getting in those years now, and I'm like, baby girl, oh my goodness, time is essential. We don't have time to waste. Time is so precious. 
I don't want to waste a moment of time. I, I, I want to get up in the morning. I try to be intentional about time. Because, man, I don't want to miss anything. I don't want to miss any opportunity. I don't want to let the sand in the hourglass slip and lose out on those precious moments. They're so precious. Time is valuable. How many of you know space is also valuable? They go hand in hand. I need my space. Sometimes I need more space. You know, I need, I need 50 feet. Sometimes I need more. I need to get away. You know, I, I got to go. I need my space. Sometimes I need space alone. Sometimes, you know, we need space to be with others. We need to share the same space as we do as we meet on the Lord's day. To share this time and this space with each other. They go hand in hand. They're both very valuable. And God understands the value of time and space. And as I was preparing, I, I said, Lord, why is it that Jesus came when he came? And God, as many people ask, I often ponder, okay, Lord, why is it that he had to come when he came and he couldn't have come sooner? Because the world needed him. We've needed him ever since the beginning, ever since sin came into the world. We needed a savior. We needed redemption. We've always needed him. But the Lord just hit me with it and I said, oh, wow, God. He said, I respected the time. I've respected the space that was needed. You see, time after time after time, God has tried to create opportunities for intimacy. We read it all throughout the Bible from the very beginning. God wanted to create opportunities to connect with us time after time after time. But time after time after time, we rejected him. And then he wanted to create open environments, spaces where we could meet with him. Hey, meet me here up on the mountain. Hey, meet me in the sanctuary. Meet me at this place. Meet me at that place. And then we rejected him. And so the Lord said, hey, I respected your time. I respected the space that you've needed. And so what the Lord did was say, okay, you know, I I'm going to give you the time. I'm going to give you your space. And when it's just right, when you realize that you cannot do without me, when the world is at a point that is pivotal when it's critical and you say now more than ever, oh God, would you intervene? I'm going to send the one who takes all of your pain away. I'm going to send the one who changes everything, who rearranges and takes you away from the bondage of sin and death at just the right time. I'm going to have him enter your space because then and only then are you going to say, OK, I need him now. And so God set up this series of events. He was very methodical, very meticulous, and he organized all these different things that would come about for Jesus Christ to come into the world. And so I want to point you to Luke chapter one today because we're going to take a look at how God orchestrates both time and space to get us exactly where he wants us to be. You know, Luke in his gospel, he gives this detailed account. He actually writes to someone. We don't exactly know who the person is, but when Luke begins his gospel, he says, hey, I'm writing to let you know of all the things that came about so you can understand why Jesus Christ is essential, why he is so important, why we need him. Luke writes in very big detail. Among all the gospel writers, Luke is the most meticulous in his writing because he wants everybody to get it. He wants the reader to understand, man, this is a lot, and you got to get every little piece of the puzzle. And so Luke talks about how God uses time, and he enters our space. And so we read in Luke chapter 1, beginning in verse 5, it tells us the story of a man and a woman and how their story coincides with the story of our redemption. Luke 1, 5, in the time of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah who belonged to the priestly division of Abijah. His wife, Elizabeth, was also a descendant of Aaron. Both of them were righteous in the sight of God, observing all the Lord's commands and decrees blamelessly. But they were childless because Elizabeth was not able to conceive, and they were both very old. And so what these verses tell us is a classic example of how bad things can happen to good people. 
how many of us can be a victim of time. How time and chance happen to us all. No matter what, no matter how great you are, no matter how righteous, no matter how, how devout you are, how obedient you are, time and chance can happen to us all. And it says that Elizabeth and her husband Zechariah were righteous, not in the sight of people. Notice what it says, not in the sight of people, of God, amen. God was looking at them and saying, hey, I find no fault with them. God wasn't cursing them. God was not putting anything upon them to be harsh to them or punish them. It's very careful to say that. God saw that they were righteous, but yet and still, he allows them to go through this circumstance, to go through this ordeal for years upon years upon years. And so for both Zechariah and Elizabeth, it would seem that time was not on their side. It would seem that after all this time, God would not meet them. God would not answer them. And many of us can relate to this. How many times do we serve and pray and seek and study and we're, we're there, we're faithful. We're faithful to God, but it still seems like we do not get what we were seeking. It still might seem like, man, you still didn't get what you were asking God for, what you were fervent in prayer for, what you were desiring of God. God, I just want this one thing. All they wanted was a child. That's all they wanted. They weren't asking for great wealth. They weren't asking for anything beyond their scope. They were saying, God, we just want a child. Would you bless us? And it seemed at this time as if God had forgotten them. And so they find themselves in a position where they're saying, God, will it ever be our time? God, is our time over? Is the time up? Because as a young couple, they would have been happy and ready. Okay, we're going to do this thing. We're going to start a family. No, it's not quite working out. Okay, we got some time. As an older couple, okay, we got some time. As a very old couple, then it becomes, well, the ship has sailed. It's over. Time's up. We just ran out. We can't do it. And then on top of that, people would look and people would, would say of them, what's wrong with you? You serve God. You love God. Why isn't it working for you? Why did God pass you over? If you were really as devout as you say you were, why is it that God did not bless you? And so now you're looking at, at the time that has been lost you're looking at the, 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 the opportunities that have been missed. You're looking at all the things that were not completed. And after you've spent enough time dealing with the pain of lack, you find yourself staying in that place, a victim of time, a prisoner in time, staying in a certain place where you can't get past that point. You say, oh, God, I don't know why you did this to me, but where I am is where I am. I, I, don't, I don't know if I can move beyond this, God. I'll still pray. I'll still worship. I'll, I'll still seek you, God. But uh, if I'm being honest, th th this point in time took my stride. This right here stopped me. I, I was looking forward to this, and now, God, I guess you've taken it away. And slowly but surely over time, our dysfunction is not just what we're struggling with, but like Elizabeth and Zechariah, it tends to become who we are. We wear it. And now they, they've taken on the title of the barren people. We're the barren couple. We're empty. We are devoid of any fruit. Even though God's done amazing things in our lives, you know, the crib is empty, so we're devoid. And there are so many of us who feel void of something because of what we do not have. We say there's no house on the plot of land. I'm void. There's no car in the driveway. For some, there, there is no baby in the crib. I'm, I'm void, God. God, you miss me. God, I, I guess I, I'm not worthy. God, you've taken from me. 
And so we find ourselves in this place and we find ourselves saying, God, I, I guess my time is up. But that's our perspective. That's not God's perspective. He, he's not looking at us as though nothing will ever be finished, nothing will ever be complete. We're looking at what did not get completed, what we didn't get accomplished, what we couldn't make happen. We're looking at the perspective from the negative space. You know, if you've got a hundred percent of the picture, oftentimes we will dwell in the 20 percent. If you've ever heard of negative space, if you've studied photography or art, you know that negative space is basically if I took a picture of Doug, Doug is, is my positive space. The subject is your positive space, right? The immediate subject. The negative space is what's around the subject. The room would be the negative space. The chairs around him, other people in the picture might be the negative space. And if we're not careful, what we do is we focus on the negative space, what's going on around us, around us, and we take ourselves out of the picture. We see, I'm not even a factor in this. It's everything that's happening in my life around me. It's all the, the time and space that operate around me. I'm troubled by this. But God is saying, listen, you need to know that you're in the picture. I'm still working with you. You're still in the positive space. I've not forgotten you. You are the subject. You are the object of my affection. I love you and I'm taking care of you and you may not see it because your perspective is not my perspective. You're seeing it from a perspective where, God, I guess you didn't work, but he's saying, oh, no, you don't understand. I'm working. I'm working. I'm making it happen. And maybe you think you've missed time. You say, well, God, I'm, I'm, I'm pushing up on 40. You know, time, time's passed me by. I put, God, I'm pushing up on 50. I'm past 50. I'm, I'm 60s. I'm 70s. I'm, I'm hitting some buttons. I'm sorry, y'all. I'm stomping on some toes now. I'm hitting 60, 70, hey, hey, God, I don't know how much more time I got. So if you're going to make it work, you're going to have to make it work. But God's not intimidated by what you feel is a lack of time. Zechariah and Elizabeth were very old, but God's not worried about that. And even though they find themselves in the negative space looking at their lack of time, God says, let me show you something. I got you. I got you. And what you were perceiving as a lack, oh, no, I'm showing you that there's abundance. We read as in verse 8, Luke chapter 1, verse 8, it says, Once when Zechariah's division was on duty and he was serving as priest before God, he was chosen by lot, according to the custom of the priesthood, to go into the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And so when it says he was chosen by lot, that's by chance. It's kind of like a roll of the dice. Hey, you know what? Oh, it's your turn, Zechariah. But it wasn't chance. God doesn't have chance and coincidence. It wasn't by chance. He was where he was supposed to be at the right time in the right place. When he goes there, according to the custom of the priesthood, he goes to light the incense. The incense represents intercession, praying for the people of God. He goes into the temple to light incense. And it says in verse 10, and when the time for burning the incense came, all the assembled worshipers were praying outside. So he goes into the temple. The people are outside. He's praying for everyone and lifting those prayers up to God. He's at the right place of prayer and seeking God. Little does he know that God's going to visit him according to his prayers. It says in verse 11, that an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing at the right side of the altar of incense. Wow. The angel is right there in the place where prayers are being brought up. Where Zechariah had come many a time as a priest. But now this time, God is visiting him and saying, guess what? I know you've been praying and I want to show you right in that place of prayer that I am with you. Verse 12, when Zechariah saw him, he was startled and gripped with fear. But the angel said to him, do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. It's been a long time, but I'm here. 
Your prayer has been heard. Your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son, and you were to call him John. He will be a joy and delight to you, and many will rejoice because of his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He has never to take wine or other fermented drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even before he is born. Now, the angel's starting to speak a prophecy to Zechariah. He's starting to tell him, hey, this is what's going to happen. The time will come. Your time is upon you. It's going to come. And, and, and as soon as the angel appears, you know, he, he's not wasting any time. He's going right in. Think, after so long, he's very old. We could say, who knows, 70, 80 years, something along those lines. He is now face to face with a messenger from God. And he's hearing about everything that he thought he lost. God is redeeming the time. And so he's looking at this and he's like, whoa, 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 whoa. You know, he's just getting a download all of a sudden. And the angel goes on to say to him, Verse 16, he will bring back many of the people of Israel to the Lord their God, and he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah, the greatest prophet in Israel's history, to turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Wow. And so according to the angel, it's all about timing. He says, hey, this is, this is the time to come. This is what God's going to do. This is God's plan of redemption because there is somebody who has to precede the king of glory. He says, Zechariah, your son is going to be the precursor. He's going to be the one who says, hey, make way for the kingdom of God. And when people hear him, they're going to know that it's from God. And then when Jesus shows up, they're going to say, that's who John was talking about. He says, there's a purpose, Zechariah. There's a plan, Zechariah. I got you. And he says, this is all about timing. You see, when God sets a plan, he sets a timer. This is one of the hardest things. I struggle with this. God sets a plan, he sets a timer. Like if you were to put a cake in the oven, he goes. <laughs> ding. And you're like. I wish I could just take that thing and, you know, flip it, twist it, do what I got to do to get it to ding sooner. But you can't. But you can't. Zechariah couldn't. He's now in this place where he's an old, old man. And he's being told, hey, the time's come. You're about to have a baby now. Of all times, really? And so Zechariah responds in verse 18. He says, how can I be sure of this? I am an old man, and my wife is well along in years. Zechariah was still in that negative space. He hadn't come out of that place. He's a hostage, a prisoner in time. He still hadn't come out. And when the angel visits him, yeah, he wants to hope. Yeah, he wants to believe. But he says, come on, man, my time's up. I'm old. You know, stuff don't work the way it used to. I'm old, man. You know, uh, I mean, you know the mechanics of this? Do you get the biology of this? We're old people. Like, come on, angel. Help me out with this. And you see, when God does a work, a miraculous work in its proper time, we're often asking the wrong questions. We're often stuck on the wrong thing. The angel didn't say, hey, you know, ask me how. The angel didn't say, hey, this is going to happen. Now you want to know why? You want to know how? He didn't say that. He said, it's going to happen. God's going to do it. God's going to deliver his people, and he's going to do it through your family and through your family's family. He's going to work this out, Zechariah. You're, it's not for you to know. It's for you to fulfill the plan. And that's what God wants us to know. Hey, it's not always for you to ask why and how and when. People come to me all the time. Well, you know, I just want to know what God's doing. I want to know how he's working. You don't need to know that. That's not for you to know. Because he's going to reveal it in time. Wow. And so the angel said to him, verse 19, the angel said to him, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God and I have been sent to speak to you and to tell you this good news. He, he, he's incensed at this point. 
Gabriel reveals his name. We don't always see the names of angels in the scripture, but Gabriel reveals his name because now he's taking a stand. And he's saying, do you know who I am? Do you really know who I am? You're going to tell me, you're going to ask me how it's going to work. I'm Gabriel. If I say it's going to work, it's going to work. Because God told me, and I was right before his throne, and he said it was going to work. Who, who, who are you? I'm, I'm Gabriel. The name Gabriel literally means man of God. The man of God appeared. You know, in the Old Testament, they would see an angel and often they would say, oh, a man of God appeared to me yesterday. They didn't know. They couldn't understand who, who they were, how they operated. All they knew was that they looked like men of God. They came from God. There was something about them. And so he's like, hey, I'm the man of God giving you the word from God. You need to follow God. Don't worry about it. I'm Gabriel. If I said it's going to happen, you know, you know what? Matter of fact, let me tell you this. Let me tell you this, Zechariah, verse 20. And now you will be silent and not able to speak until the day this happens. Because you did not believe my words. You didn't listen to the man of God, which will come true at their appointed time. He says, Zechariah, there's a plan and a purpose. It's going to happen. It's going to be fulfilled. And Zechariah, now you need to shut up. Because you found yourself in that space where you've been speaking against it. Where you said, I don't know how it's going to happen. Can it really happen? And the angel was like, look, don't even say nothing. Because the second you start opening your mouth and you get around other people, you're going to curse it. You're going to curse it, Zechariah. So, so do me a favor. I'm going to close your mouth, keep you silent, because I need the plan to be fulfilled. And see, this is for us. The right word at the right time is powerful. When we speak the right word at the right time, it's powerful. We speak the wrong word. Even in the right time, we speak the wrong word. We can curse the will of God for our lives. God's wanting to do a work, but we can speak against it and curse it. And so he says, don't say nothing, no more. I'm going to shut you up. I'm going to keep you silent. And Zechariah was troubled because he had been occupying this space for so long. He didn't realize that God didn't forget his prayers. And he thought it was too late. But someone needs to know today that it's never too late. It's never too late. And even if you think it's too late, even if you're saying to yourself, man, it's too late. That's not what God says of you. It's not too late. And no matter how long you've been waiting, God has been setting up an appointment for you. He set the appointment. The time is ready. The angel said, hey, the time's going to come. The time is ready for you, but he's getting you ready for the time. He's getting you ready for the time. We don't know why, but apparently Elizabeth and Zechariah couldn't have a baby at 20, 30, 40, what have you, because they weren't ready in that time. They couldn't handle in that time. There are things that we can't handle at a certain time that God says, I've got to get you ready for this event. I've got to prepare you because perhaps it was that they were so righteous and perhaps that when we're righteous and we're following God and we're serving God, we think that things happen according to our righteousness. But we need to understand that God doesn't fulfill things just because we're so great, but God brings things to pass because he wants to show his greatness within us. He wants to show that he's working. And the only way that he could do this in their lives was he had to make sure that it was at a time where it was absolutely impossible. Because with God, all things are possible. He had to make sure people knew, hey, this is going to work. This is going to happen. Because God will make it happen. We read in verse 21, meanwhile, the people were waiting for Zechariah and wondering why he stayed so long in the temple. When he came out, he could not speak to them. They realized he had seen a vision in the temple for he kept making signs to them, but remained unable to speak. He's, he's trying to tell them, and they're like, okay, I think we, we angel something. We don't, we don't know. But he was trying to reveal something to them, but he could not speak because if he spoke to everybody, imagine what they say. Zechariah, what are you talking about, man? 
Bro, you've been in that room with that incense way too long. That stuff is, whew. I don't know what's up with you. Ain't you had no baby? Bro, you too old for that stuff, man. You better chill. Can't do that. So he couldn't speak. God ordained it. He could not speak. But he didn't need to speak to fulfill the plan of God. Man, we ain't got to talk to make and do we? See, some of y'all ain't going to get me. Let me read this next verse. Let me, let me get you here. Let me get you there. Let me get you there. All right? Let, ladies, please forgive me. This is, this is, this is man talk right here. And yeah, right, Dave. Help me out, Dave. Help me out. Don't leave me hanging, bro. Verse 23, when his time of service was completed, he returned home. You got to catch it. 24, after his wife Elizabeth became pregnant and for five months remained in seclusion. You get that? I'm going to read it one more time. When his time of service was completed, he returned home. After this, his wife Elizabeth became pregnant and for five months remained in seclusion. He didn't have to talk. He didn't have to say a word. Guys, we ain't got to say a word. Oh, man, see, y'all ain't even with me today, man. Y'all ain't even with me today. My man was old. He had to say nothing. He just had to get down to business. He just had to make it happen. He got home. He said he had to say nothing. He, you know, it's funny how men work, isn't it? How us guys work? We going to do what we got to do. We got we to talk about it. Ladies got to talk about it. We ain't gotta, I ain't got to say nothing to you. It's amazing how, how this transpires. And so since he didn't have nothing to say, he didn't tell her nothing, he made it happen either way, and they conceive. Two people who were looking for burial plans conceived a new life. It's incredible. And it says that it transitions our story now from Zechariah to Elizabeth. It says that Elizabeth becomes pregnant, and she's secluded for five months. She finds herself alone because, for one, she has no voice of her husband to comfort her. The woman is alone. She can't talk to anybody in the streets, can't go out in the town, share the good news with them. They're going to speak. Are you crazy? What are you thinking? Y'all need to learn how to play checkers. Can't be having no babies. People are going to say something about her. She shows them the bump. They're like, this is insane. I don't even want to know what's going to happen to you. She's stretching in ways that she, people don't stretch at her age. She's finding herself in a position where now she's feeling pains. You know, young women do that stuff. Old ladies don't do that stuff. And so she's finding herself in a whole new area where only God can meet her. Only God can comfort her. Only God can be there to care for her. She can't have the consolation of anyone else. And you see, this is what God wants us to see, that there are times where he gets us alone. There are silent times. There's times where he says, I'm working even in the midst of the silence. There's even a silence in the Bible. 400 years of silence from Malachi to Matthew. God says, I'm working in the silent times. You can trust that I'm working when it's just you and me alone. Now I'm working in the silent time because that's when you're going to lean in to listen to me. That's when you're going to say, okay, God, you got to tell me what's going on. She remained in seclusion for five months. And all she could do in that time was seek God and praise God. Couldn't lean on anybody else. There's a word for somebody. You can't lean on somebody else to get what I can give to you. There's a time where you can only get in his presence and get what you need. For many of us, we're running to people time after time after time. We're trying to be around people for comfort, and God is saying, oh, no, I, I'm going to draw you into myself. You need that alone time with your father. Because what you're going through, nobody else can comfort you in. Nobody else understands. There's not a soul on earth that you can communicate with that they will understand the gravity of what you're dealing with. But I get it. And I've got you during this time. I'm holding you. And so Elizabeth goes into seclusion. Verse 25, she speaks. She says, the Lord has done this for me. God. 
God has given me the answer to my prayers. Even in this season, in these days, he has shown his favor and taken away my disgrace among the people. She says, as a woman, I was so disgraced. People talk bad about me. They dogged me out. They said I wasn't, I wasn't doing something right. And now look. God has removed all of that, and now he's shown that he will meet me in the fullness of time. She goes into that space, and it's just her, and, and, and nobody else knows what she's going through, or so she thinks, but there's somebody who does. She's got a miracle baby in the belly, and who in the world would know about that? Who in the world can testify to that? But there's somebody in her family who knows, and this is where the story ties in. Elizabeth's cousin, Mary, comes over and says, I got to go see her. And when she goes to see her, Elizabeth, with this miracle baby in her belly, filled with the Holy Spirit, jumps up. <gasps> oh, wow. Praise the Lord. She sees her cousin and she knows her cousin is with child. And the two of them rejoice together because she's carrying John the Baptist and Mary is carrying the Lord Jesus. The two of them connect and they come to understand each other's time, each other's season, what they're going through. And there's comfort. And then this God reveals to us that it's not just about us. That you may think that, man, this is it. This is it, God. You may look and say, oh, God, my, my, my time has been wasted. And then God reveals to you that, no, your time's not been wasted. He brings things about in the fullness of time. And then you say, oh, God, oh, God, this is a lot. This is a lot. Oh, God. And the next thing you know, God brings you that comfort and consolation. And Elizabeth's comfort and consolation was the comfort of all of the people of God. It goes bigger than us. That when she is greeted by her cousin, she's greeted by the presence of Christ within her and recognizes that all of God's people will be delivered from their suffering and realizes that everything she's been through up until this point has been worthwhile because now the king is coming. Now redemption is at hand. Now the season is upon her. She gets to rejoice. And as we are comforted by the presence of Christ in this season, as we find ourselves rejoicing over the coming of the one who will redeem us from all of our sins, we can find ourselves saying, oh, praise God. Oh, praise God. Because the darkness gives way to the light. Even in this season, even in the darkest time of year, a light is shining in the brightness of Christ. And so you and I get to behold a glory that even Elizabeth could not imagine, that Mary could not fully imagine, that you and I get to behold this glory of Christ and celebrate the fullness thereof. And so we rejoice in this, and that Jesus Christ broke time and space to come and meet with you and me. That he went through everything for us. The one who came in a form that was beneath him, below him, that was less than. Jesus Christ comes as a little baby, a little baby born in a cave. He's not born into royalty and riches, but born in such a way that he's viewed as common, treated as lowly. There's no room for him. There's no space for him. Yet even though he comes into that, even though he grows up and lives a life equated with suffering, and even though he lives a life and dies a horrible death and raises to life again, he's raised in the fullness of glory that we might know that our time is at hand. Wow, this is beautiful. And this is why we celebrate in this season the wonderful presence of Christ. Come on, Alan, help me out today, brother. As we prepare our hearts for the communion, 
we find that the Lord Jesus became for us all things, all things that we might, that we might know that he is sufficient, that he is perfect. We behold the, the bread. It's pierced all throughout. And that we know that Jesus Christ was pierced on the cross. It's striped, and by his stripes, we are healed. It's delicate. It can be broken easily because his broken body is what makes us whole. Jesus Christ became for us the bread of life. And so as we partake of the communion, we recognize that he came in the fullness of time. And when Jesus came in that fullness of time, he revealed to us that his body and his blood would be all that we need. When Jesus sat with his disciples, he would have broken the bread, blessed it, said the traditional prayer, Baruch Atah Adonai, Eloheinu Melech HaOlam, Hamotzi Rechayim, Yeshua. Blessed are you, Lord our God, King of the universe, who gives us the bread of life in Christ. Let us pass the bread at this time.